it's working here we go hi hello and welcome hi here they come here comes our crowd um <clears throat> welcome welcome it takes a hot minute for the audience to fill in here at alta live but hi hello and welcome welcome Thank you for joining us at Alta Live with today's guest, artist Anita Kuntz. Anita is well known, well known for her covers for magazines like the New York Times, the New Yorker, Time Magazine, Rolling Stone, the New York Times Magazine. She's been named one of the 50 most influential women in Canada. She's been appointed an officer of the Order of Canada and has received the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal of Honor. That's honor with a U in it. So it's very fancy. Um, it is an absolute treat to have her join us today, um, especially to discuss her new book. It's a collection of portraits of groundbreaking women called Original Sisters, Portraits of Tenacity and Courage. Before we start chatting with Anita, some brief housekeeping. Alta Live is a digital interview series we do here at Alta Journal. My name is Beth Spotswood. I'm Alta's digital editor. If you are unfamiliar with Alta, we are an award-winning quarterly magazine and website focused on California and the West. And on very special, very important occasions, um, we go north of the border to Canada to chat with people like Anita. If you like what we do here today, I hope that you will check us out at altaonline.com. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask questions for Anita. We'll chat for about 30 minutes and then get to as many of your questions as we can. This all will be recorded um, and posted to altaonline.com later today. We're also gonna shoot you an email with a link to that video. In fact, Alta's editorial assistant, Jessica Blau, will take notes throughout our discussion. And she and I are gonna send you links to everything we talk about today, including where to buy Anita's book, where to see more of her work, um, some of the artists that she recommends we all check out. So keep an eye out sometime this afternoon for that email. With that, Anita, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, half an hour isn't really enough, but I'm going to, I'll answer whatever questions you have or, or if anybody in the audience has questions, I, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I also, I love to kick it off by um, having everyone check in in the chat. Please use the chat and let us know where you're Zooming in from today. I am in Nevada, California. Anita, where are you? Toronto, Canada. Toronto. Um, anyone else from Canada here? Here, oh, Pasadena. All right, here they come. They're going to let us know where they're from. This is so fun. Cupertino, Los Gatos, Irvine, Florida, Berkeley, LA. Okay. Anita, um, can oh, you... <laughs> Someone's from Poland. That's Someone's from Poland. Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. That's amazing. Yeah. Let's cast a wide net here. We'll bring them in. Um, well, you know, you're I would say that you're a national treasure, but you're we can't claim you in the United States, so we'll call you an international treasure. Um <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about your style, which is so recognizable. And I think that perhaps the best way to do that is to if everyone can bear with me while I share my screen and let's look at some work while we talk about it. Um, if that's cool with everyone. So we're gonna play a slideshow. Um, can everyone see, hopefully, yes, we've got um, John Belushi here on the cover of Rolling Stone. And Anita, a lot of your work, um, perhaps the work that we're most familiar with is magazine covers. How did you get started how does your artwork, you, an artist from Canada, end up um, designing covers that we see all over the world for places like Rolling Stone and The New Yorker? Well, I've been doing it for a really long time. And when I was a little girl, my uncle was an illustrator and his motto was art for education. So I grew up with the idea that art could, art didn't have to be just something to hang on a wall, but it could have a function in our culture. And where my uncle was doing art for education, I really loved the whole world of, of news and what was going on in the world and, and social issues and political issues and all, all stuff like that. So, so I went to art school in Toronto 
And I started taking a portfolio around to all the different uh, magazines and advertising agencies and stuff like that. And I started getting work. And um, it took a long time to get clients like Rolling Stone and Time Magazine. But I just I just kind of worked really hard. And I kept, you know, I started with small publishers and I kept going. And actually, I did um, I did live in New York for quite a long time because that's where all the, the best publishers are. But, um, you know, like it just I just want to say to any young artists, I mean, it's just, you know, you put in the time. And if you spend enough time on it, and if you, you know, like if you work really hard and spend enough years on it, then, then you know, the people do come to recognize you and recognize your work. And it's a pretty small industry. So, you know, illustrators are pretty well known by other illustrators and publishers. And um, so anyway, yeah, but I also have to say that I feel incredibly lucky because I, I was working and I have been working for magazines in a time where people were still really buying magazines kind of before the internet, right? So that was when I was at my busiest. So, um, so yeah, it's just kind of a matter of, of hard work, doing it a lot, getting your work out there, you know, stuff like that. When, when you're presented with an opportunity like this, this is a ranking, a Rolling Stone ranking of all 141 cast members of SNL. Did they say, okay, do Belushi and do him as the samurai? How how involved do you get to be? How much instruction do you get? Well, this one, I mean, I remember it being an art school, <clears throat> very first uh, um, Saturday Night Lives. I mean, it was it was so it was so raw at that time. But but so when I got the call to do this, like I had worked for Rolling Stone for for years and years, um, and doing inside portraits, like a history of rock and roll, tons of. Uh, portraits of rock stars. So when I got the call to do this, of course, I was thrilled because I love the show that much. Um, and it's, you know, really, uh, you know, it's, it was a great assignment. But if they did, they actually didn't know what they wanted to do. They knew it was an uh, anniversary of the show. And so they were, they were sort of going back and forth. And I did all kinds of sketches, like first they wanted, um, you know, like, like, you know, like, who do we do? We had, we had sort of um, groups of people, and then they narrowed it down to four, and then they finally narrowed it down to John Belushi. And so the thing is, you never really quite know who the subjects are. And then once they said John Belushi, I was like, yes, okay. So then I then I did drawings of him. You remember with the the bee costume and, and oh yeah, uh, <clears throat> different um, you know with, with the different characters. And this is the one they finally picked. So, but the thing is. The funny thing is about, um, you know, about about having painted so many celebrities and, and rock stars and actors, everybody thinks it's so glamorous and everybody thinks I actually meet these people, but I don't. I just I sit in my <laughs> studio, I paint them and I hope people will like the, the end result. Um, well, this issue looks like it's from 2015, so that'd be pretty amazing if you got to meet John Belushi in 2015. <laughs> You can have true. Shirley MacLaine kind of connect you. Yeah. Um, this cover, you actually didn't send me this, but Jessica Blau um, oh. pointed pointed this out that this was a cover that really resonated with her. Um, she's on the Alta team, and and you know, I her question was, um, how do you develop? Uh, we get the concept, you know, it's the class photo. Um, it's something so familiar to all of us, and yet everyone is wearing their pandemic masks. Um, how did you develop this? Was that the concept? What was your thought process in terms of, okay, we're going to talk about education during the pandemic. How am I going to make that really, how am I going to represent that on the cover of a magazine so it's instantly um, relatable? Well, that's that's always the biggest challenge. I mean, the New Yorker really does not call you and say, "Will you do a cover?" It's really about pitching ideas. And so um, I've worked with them since I think 1995 or something like that. And every time I have an idea about something that's going on in the world, I send it to them. And you know, maybe they, you know, hopefully they'll like the idea and and I'll uh, get to do the finish. Um, but I mean, we, you know, this is it. It was just so obvious to me. We were just in the middle of this really scary pandemic, and it was really important to me to to remember the the the, pe the kids who were in school and the ones who were graduating and how they were really missing out on so much and how difficult it was for everybody and i think i i think i got the idea of thumbing through an old um yearbook of mine and you know and and just seeing all these like funny photos and i thought well that wouldn't work right now first of all because you know uh, we need i needed to paint a lot more diversity and 
also, you know, there was, you know, you wouldn't be able to even see their faces. So there was something I think bittersweet about this one. Ultimately, I wanted to honor all the students who were who were um, graduating at that time last year. And sadly, it's still relevant, or it was still relevant last uh, June. Well, no, I love that Jessica um, picked this cover as she was a senior at this time in college. She graduated during the pandemic. Um, and now works for Alta, so hopefully it'll work out for her. This is one you sent me, and this is um, this kind of we get into political satire, um, super exaggerated features. How do you decide when you are doing a? First of all, who is this? It's it's nobody. It's um it's a, well it's supposed to be kind of a, a Pinocchio businessman. So. Um, I didn't. I try. I deliberately tried to make it look like nobody. I don't think anyone actually even looks like that. But, but you know, as an artist, you can really, you know, you can use your imagination. You can certainly use all kinds of uh, artistic license. But this was. I just wanted to. You know, this was about lying, and so I wanted to to you know do something that was a. You know, when you do a cover, it has to be an instant read. You know, and so I thought it's got to be. You know, somebody has to look at it on a newsstand, and so I thought that the Pinocchio idea has to be like that's the one I have to do it has to be it, like you have to instantly know what it's about the trouble with working for magazines like time magazine is that um so they I used to do a lot of covers for them I haven't recently but um so they you have to do something in a day like the paint the the, the deadlines are so so scary like they they would call me Wednesday around supper time and I would have to drop everything and they say, okay, we have a cover. And then I would start working then in the evening, send sketches to the editor, get approval at 11, work all night, finish the painting and send it to the send it through FedEx to New York the next day so that it could be at the pr printer on Friday. So it could be on the newsstands by Monday. Crazy, like it's such an adrenaline rush. So whenever, um, so the idea of doing something like this about lying, it had to be quick, it had to be easy and I had to be able to do it quickly. Well, you send you send an actual physical copy. You're not emailing. Yeah, I used to do that. Um, some magazines still like the physical painting, and I'm still a traditional painter. Now, of course, um, now of course with technology, I'm able to just you know send send something digitally, transfer it digitally. But this was uh, when was this? This was quite a while ago. So at that time, you know, we were still two thousand. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's interesting that time moves so quickly. <laughs> um, but but the Time magazine has the turnaround of days like that. If you're hearing Wednesday and it's on the newsstand on Monday, I at Alta, we are quarterly. We'll, we know what our covers are months in advance. Um, yeah. And it sounds like the process for each, I realize I'm speaking specifically to magazine covers here and, and we're absolutely going to talk about your book, but it seems like the process is so dramatically different for each publication with Rolling Stone you're sending or with, um, is it Rolling, it's New Yorker, you're sending them ideas, time comes to you. And I, I have them screaming at you while you're having dinner saying, draw me a liar. Um, is that is that just part of the gig and you kind of you got to roll with the punches you sort of do and it takes a while to sort of calm down a little bit i mean i, I remember the first job i ever had i mean i was crying i was like i can't do this this is too stressful you know and the, but, but you sort of you sort of get used to it and um you know time magazine that you know they're they're really fast but what you know when i do something for rolling stone that they, they're fortnightly so every two weeks there's a little bit more room. Any magazine that's monthly, there's there is more room. The New Yorker works a little bit further ahead because they already know what the subjects are going to be, unless there is a major news story, and then they need something very quickly. So, but but you know, every every publication is different. Every you know, they have a different audience. They they want different things. So you just have to sort of understand who the audience is. I'm also just from a um, media standpoint, enjoying how old this magazine is. This is March thirteenth, two thousand. And on the cover, they have their AOL keyword. God bless them. It's very sweet. Um, this is amazing. I love this. Can you tell me a little bit about this New Yorker cover from 2007? Well, I was, um, I had an apartment in New York. I was there for over 20 years. I mean, so I, I saw a lot of things in the subway, you know, and, and um, I, I, I wanted that to be the idea, like all, you know, things that you could see in a New York subway. But I also wanted it to have a little, 
you know, um, you know, a little undertone of, of some kind of a political statement. So it was, I wanted to do something that had to do with how women present ourselves in different cultures. And, you know, and that in certain cultures, you know, women are really covered. And then you've got this kind of, uh, I don't know, I, I was thinking Britney Spears, uh, um, you know, sort of, you know, where, where that is not a problem at all for, you know, for, for women. So, um, and the only thing, and the thing that sort of is is a common to all three of them are the the eyes. I wanted to call it three visions. Um, anyway, so that that was kind of the thinking. It was it was a little bit of a, I guess it was a little bit of a gender statement, but also it was, uh, you know, it was about as New York as you can get. I also noticed that there's a K. You've signed this one, um, whereas on the time cover we don't get to see your signature. Is that something that? you negotiate with the magazine? Do some let you have uh, your, you know, mark on the cover and some don't? What are the rules the around that? I, the New Yorker, I love working for the New Yorker. I mean, they're amazing and they, they do deliberately want you to sign. So they, um, they're, they just, you know, I mean, the, the covers editor is Francoise Mouly and she's married to Art Spiegelman and they're, they're such a power couple and they just, you know, they're, they're in the arts and they, they really, uh, they're really great with their artists and they, you know, they, so they really want you to sign. So how important is that? I mean, I think, you know, when you get to a certain level, you can kind of pick and choose um, what jobs you take, presumably. Do you, do you try and work with a certain type of organization? Is there a certain kind of vibe that you look for when partnering with a publication? Well, I, you know, I think, um, when I, you know, I mean, through through the years, I developed a certain style, and the style is not going to be appropriate for a lot of publications, and it is appropriate for, you know, for, for actually for the publications that I do want to work for. So I deliberately, um, I deliberately go for publications where there's a lot of creative freedom. Um, that's really, really important to me because if people, you know, if I, if it's a great subject and people are telling me what to do, then I'm I'm more concerned about making them happy than than making it a really great image, right? Um, so anyway, so, so that's, so it's the, um, autonomy is, is pretty important to me too in the, you know, in anything in the, um, you know, in magazines and publishing and anything, but this is, uh, this was a cover that was about steroid abuse. And again, for the New York times, this was a real, real quickie one. So I had to, you know, again, my, the first thing is to try to make an arresting image that really grabs you and then, um, you know, and then just try to try to work with that. This was a fast, this was a quick turnaround. This was a quick turnaround too, yeah. I mean, the New York Times Magazine was coming out once a week. I, they, they may have planned this a couple of weeks ahead, but but again, you know, really, real, really quick, really quick. So so as I've, as I've sort of gone along in my career, I really have learned how to work really, really very quickly and to take, um, you know, to take shortcuts and, and not do things that aren't necessary. Just go, go straight for the, go for the prize. <laughs> As you're working with a publication, do you ever find yourself, I mean, is there a, a struggle between art and commerce per se? Are they, do people ever ask you to go and do something very specific that you're like, no, that doesn't mesh with my artistic vision for this. I'm not going to do it or I'm pissed I mean, off, but I'll do it anyway. I, I, I do know that, um, I mean, of course there's always compromise, you know, this is not the, this is not my show. I mean, of course there's a, you know, when you're an illustrator, you work in collaboration with, with, you know, with, there's a bigger picture there. I mean, you're not, it, it's really not about me when, when I do my fine art, then I, I can do whatever I want, obviously. But I mean, you know, like I, I'm trying to be as professional as possible. Um, and, and it, it is, it is really, it is important to me. Um, I have had suggestions from editors that I haven't necessarily liked, but, but, you know, if I can persuade them out of it, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I have to say there have been some suggestions that made the image better. So it's, you know, everything is different. Every job is different. Every painting is different. Every subject is different. So, so constantly yeah. changing. Well, then let's talk about um, Original Sisters. This is your new book. This is um, over 150 portraits of women, pioneers. I love Greta. We have Greta here in this incredible flower headdress and forward by Roxanne Gay. Can you just very briefly tell me how you scored that? I, I did not. The, it, the amazing designer Chip Kidd um, scored that one. They're, they're friends. And I, I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I it just, 
I couldn't believe anything of this whole project. So I, Why? I, well, I just, I, well, so this is, this is, this was a labor of love. And I started doing this as the pandemic, as we went into shutdown, I thought, uh Oh, you know, I better, you know, I, I'm going to be home for, you know, we didn't know how long. And, you know, I had illustration work, but, but I thought I, I need to do a deep dive into something. So I had wanted to do portraits of women for a long time. And I thought, well, here we go. I think I'm going to have enough time to do something, so, you know, substantial. So I started doing one portrait a day. And, um, and it was really, you know, it, the, the painting was fun. And I, I, you know, and again, I, from being an illustrator, I, I know how to, how to do it quickly. And so, so doing one a day actually helped my mental state because I felt as though even though all this stuff was going on, I, I, I did something that was meaningful once a day. And it felt, it kind of made me feel good. By the same token, I was doing research into these incredible women and incredible stories. And I thought, you know, the things that they, they went through you know, I, relative to that, I, I'm being asked to stay home, you know, that's like nothing, like that's no big deal. So the whole thing was, um, you know, and I, I just kept finding more and more women. And I kept thinking, why have I not heard of these, these, why have I not heard these astonishing stories? And I kept going and I kept going. And then I, at, at one point, I put together a PDF. And I sent it to Chip Kidd, who is a complete rock star, amazing designer, like the best I like I, I and I just sent him a PDF and, um, and I kind of forgot about it. And he he wrote back and said, we're interested. And I was I couldn't believe it. Like I, I was just I'm, I'm blown away that something that was like my my small labor of love has actually um, been something that has that has gained momentum. And Roxanne Gay was like the icing on the cake. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, you got to add her to volume two. She's amazing. I, I, you know what? I did her portrait for. She's in volume one, but she's not a story. She's she's the, but it was she would she needs to be a story for sure. Yeah. Um. So when you how do you kind of select who? How did you decide who made the first cut? There are 156. Right. Well, um, what are there? 100. I think there are 154 in the book. Okay. Um, but because the pandemic kept going, so did I. So I've got like almost 300 now, but. The thing is, once you start, like once I started, they were everywhere. Like I just kept seeing them in, in blog posts on Google. Um, the New York Times did something about, uh, you know, forgotten uh, obituaries, you know, you know, so and so I, I read about that. Um, and, you know, I, I have such a I have like a, a backlog of, of at least 100. So, you know, the way that I chose them was just if it, if it was some somebody I found interesting, somebody I thought we should all know about you know, I went with it and I, and I went for, I really went for the stories, you know, like these incredible stories. I've got rebels and pirates and, you know, wrestlers and, and, and geniuses, lots of women in STEM, lots of women who did extraordinary things during the, the Holocaust. Um, you know, they're, they're, once you start looking, they're everywhere. Do you need to know the story of the subject before you begin to illustrate them? Yeah, that was that was really the point. And what we were talking about before about like exaggerating features and stuff like that. In this book, I deliberately made a choice not to do any exaggeration. This was to honor women. This was this is not to make anything funny. It's just this is information based. Um, I tried to do, you know, as beautiful portraits as I could. Um, I tried to use, I usually, um, a lot of times I use kind of darker colors, but I tried to make the colors a little bit brighter so that I want kids interested in these. This is a book for men and women and kids. And, you know, these are just really cool, a lot of really cool stories. How, so for, are you pitching volume two now is the idea that, I mean, when we talk about great women in history, we well, let's do a hundred volumes, but, but, um, oh. That's the thing. Like, where, where do you stop? Like 150 is not enough in, in my view. Yeah. So anyway, well, no, I haven't pitched it yet. I worked, you know, this one isn't even out yet. So who was your first, who was the first um, portrait that you started with when you just sat down and drew a woman? She was the first one. And uh, this is St. Abby. And she was a, she was a nun in, in Scotland. And heard that the Viking marauders were going to come and kill all, all the Herbert, all of her sisters. So she told them all to cut off their noses so that uh, they would be so hideous and they wouldn't, they wouldn't, you know, kill them or they wouldn't rape them. Um, but they did anyway, but, but apparently that's where the phrase to cut off your nose to spite your face comes from. So see, it's stuff like that. Like, and I just, I just kept finding this really 
you know, interesting, interesting things, women who should be household names. Can you tell us a little bit more about who's behind you? Oh, um, okay. So these, these are the originals. So these are, um, so I've done them all kind of the same size. After all this is done, I, I would love to donate them to a museum or something. I don't know. So I deliberately made them small and easily transportable. Um, Elizabeth I is, um, I, I think everybody knows who she is. There, there's some who are a little bit uh, better known. Um, and she, uh, you know, I mean, the, it, during her reign, it, she had such a successful reign. I mean, the arts flourished, everything flourished uh, during the Elizabethan time. Shirley Chisholm was uh, a presidential candidate and she was just, she suffered so much racism. I mean, they didn't even let her, you know, she, I think she was allowed to finally give one speech. There was no way that she would ever have made it just because she wasn't allowed to basically. So, but she's, she's really inspirational. Nina Simone, I've got Malala up there. You know, these are the ones that, that are a little bit more well-known, Angela Davis, Alicia Garza. Um, so you can see that I've got a whole, you know, um, women from, like the, the book actually goes back to um, cave paintings because according to National Geographic, um, the, uh, some of the first paintings were likely done by women, not men. So some of the hands they've analyzed and they were decidedly female. So that kind of, that kind of changes the nature of what we, you know, like, uh, why wouldn't they, have, why couldn't they have been women? Of course they could have been women. Anyway, Hedy Lamarr um, was a, a glamorous uh, movie star, but also she invented the, precur the precursor to what the, to what Wi-Fi was. Um, but, but there are many more um, examples like this one, Maria Marion, who, who was a, a, an illustrator and she, she illustrated beautiful, you know, beautiful plants and butterflies and everyone thought, oh, she's making pretty pictures, but she actually had a, a, a scientific understanding of how, of how things work. Like she understood metamorphosis and she understood that flies did not come from mud, which was thought at the time. And it wasn't until later that she was respected as the scientist that she was and not someone just who just did pretty pictures. But, you know, like, I, I don't know, I don't know how many to show you, I've got, you know, this is, this is just a few of them, but like I said, we're getting close to 300, so. Um, your work is so recognizable. It is very, your style is, is so specific, is beautiful and evocative and so specific to you. Is that something that just comes naturally? This is the way that you draw and you paint, or is this something really intentional that you have? spent years, I mean, of course you've spent years honing it, but if, are you very, very intentional about your style or is this just Anita and this is the way you draw? Well, this is, you know, that's kind of the million dollar question when, when um, art students leave school is how do I develop a style, you know? And, and it's, you, you can't really manufacture a style. It comes about when, by, by years and years of work and years and years of drawing. And a lot of it has to do with um, I mean, a lot of times, um, I like I've, I've actually thought about this. Um, I haven't used a, an awful lot of photographic reference, and that's why sometimes the things are distorted. They're not distorted <laughs> because you know I, it's it's deliberate. It's just that oh my god, I have two hours left. I got to do this quickly. So a lot of it is um, just just the natural distortion of the way that I paint, and that is something that is developed over the course of time. So at this point, it's it's not necessarily intentional. It just it just it's the way I draw and it looks right to me. So when you, when you were doing a portrait of someone who is alive, let's say a famous person, not necessarily a Malala who I can't see having a problem with her portrait, but have you ever drawn someone who has, how do people react when you do their portrait? It's, it's really hard to do people's portraits because I, I don't think any of us know what we look like, you know, like really yeah. look like. So I think um, I, I do look at portrait painters and how they work and, and they, you know, I mean, they, they really, you know, they, they pay homage to their subjects, basically. Portrait painting is very different than caricature. Caricature is, you know, often about political characters and, and you know, there's a little bit of satire there. So it's a little bit of, you know, putting them in their place, but um, just port real portrait, you know, portrait painting, which is what I've tried to do here. Um, is uh, I, I think, I mean, I, I would hope that that anybody who's alive would, would like the portrait that I did because I, I certainly tried to honor them. But you've never had a scathing letter of like, I saw your work of my cover on the New Yorker and my forehead's way smaller than that. I'm, I'm 
just trying to think. I'm sure I have. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've had a lot of mail about the content of the work because, you know, um, it, you know, j just the way the way that it is in the world now. I mean, it's it, it, politically we're very divided. So if I do something for this group, that this group's not going to like it, you know. So it kind of goes without saying that not everybody's going to going to um, going to like the work. But I have to. I, I now that now that I think about it, I do remember presenting someone with a portrait of himself, and he said, "Oh, my neck is so thin." And I'm like, "Oh, <laughs> sorry," you know. So I, I did not do that intentionally. But when I looked, I thought, "Yeah, your neck's pretty thin." So anyway, that is. You know, um, anyway. when you when you're doing political um, work, be they covers fast turnaround or, or you have a longer piece, do you think that you come at I saw I don't have an example of it, unfortunately, but you did a Donald Trump, of course, do you come at global issues with a Canadian perspective by any chance? Is there something I, Canadian I, I, in your work? I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's, it's certainly not deliberate, but I think, yeah, I think that sort of living, you know, growing up next to a superpower where, um, yeah, you know, it's just where we're like the little bit, the little brother or the, the poor cousin or something like that. I think, I think a lot of us uh, sort of feel that way. And, but also there's something in, in that Canadian content, which was actually Canadian content was actually government registered. Uh, legislated so that's I don't know if you ever saw Bob and Doug McKenzie but that was a spoof on having on that the government sort of legislated a certain amount of Canadian content so that's why they were so ultra Canadian so that was kind of based on on something that was really true but even just um you know some of the humor that we you know we're talking about you know some of the humor that comes out of it I think it is a little bit different and I I'm not quite sure I can put my finger on it maybe we're just a little weirder or something I don't know I, Anita and I earlier were speaking about my love of Canadian comedians. Um, so let's dive into some questions. We're getting several about both the tools you use and your process. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you begin an assignment specifically? Let's let's start with an assignment, a magazine assignment. Um, do you start with a pencil sketch? What tools are you using? Um, so yeah, when I get an assignment, uh, let's say from a magazine, um, I'll get an email or a call and, um, you know, and I will get a manuscript to read and, uh, and, and I, I typically have a conversation with the art director about what, you know, if the editor has any uh, ideas or, or what, what is expected. And then, you know, then there's the whole thing about, you know, when they need it, what, you know, budget and you do all that stuff. Um, and then I usually go away and, and uh, read the manuscript and think about it and come up with a few sketches. And then I email the sketches and then we, we discuss the sketches or else they'll just pick one. And then I, uh, and then I take the sketch and I, I paint it. And I, I, like I said, I'm still a traditional painter. Many of my students are incredibly good at, at you know, digital painting, I'm not. Um, so, so that's what I do. And I, since I was very young, I've used only water soluble materials, which is, you know, th you know, I don't know why I had the foresight to do that. So everything has been safe, you know, like it, I haven't been breathing toxic materials. So, so it's all water-based it's, um, you know, watercolor and acrylic and gouache. So, um, so that's, so that's what I, that's what I paint and I paint sort of layer over layer, um, yeah, and that's what I do. And the um, the illustrations. I mean, let's just see. I've got a couple here. Um, usually, they're. I mean, they're they're tiny. You know. Oh, I love when we get to see this stuff. This, this is, is so cool. This is kind of an older one, and then I just did something for the nation. Um, so you can. So you can. You can. Oh see my God, Whistler's mother. Yeah, that that was about the about Texas. Um, oh. So, yeah, so I mean, you know, like yes. so this size. But then when I when I do my fine art, um, I work big, like big, because I because there's no deadline, and then I can really spend time. And then I use uh, a different types of acrylics, and I use different different, you know, experiment a little bit more, and that's just really fun. And that's for myself. I know that that's not, you know, um, you know, that it's entirely by myself for myself, and uh, that's it. Well, so yeah, Dan asks, you know, how does your process change when you go off deadline and into your personal work? Obviously, you have a lot more time and you work in a different scale. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly it. I mean, um, I did one, you know, I've, I've sort of, I'm just playing, I'm just playing around. I mean, I can, I can play more because it's not for something serious. Like I'm not, I don't have a, 
you know, have to do something serious and, and, uh, and, and um, honor a deadline. I mean, I, there's, you know, there's as much time as I want to take on it. And that's why it's so interesting for me to just to, to see what happens when I work really big. Um, and it is, it is a little different. It is a little different. And um, so a lot of the stuff that I do for myself, um, I'm, I've actually been compiling it into books. So because there is a common thread to it, and I think um, it's like, I really like print. I really like illustrating. I love writing, you know, so, so as a fine artist, I, I don't really fit in that category. I don't think I, it, I always come back to print. It's, it's interesting. I always come back to books and magazines and publishing. That is interesting. Yes, yeah. Um, we, Lisa asks, did art school, and I know that you're also an educator, um, did art school help or hinder your distinctive and intuitive style? Um, well, I, for me, it was really important to go to art school because I, I, I came from a small town and I didn't know anybody and I didn't know anything. So I really didn't know anything. I mean, um, I, you know, I knew my uncle had been an illustrator, but he died years prior. So I didn't have it, you know, I just didn't, anyway, it was important for me to be around other artists. And I, I did learn a lot. I mean, a lot of it, I think at that time, I mean, when you go to art school, you just, you just, you're like a sponge, you absorb everything. Some of it you're going to, is not going to be appropriate later and you can sort of reject that later but for me it was really important i mean um these days i think a lot of i don't think you necessarily you know I'm, i have to be careful how to say this i don't think it's it, you necessarily have to go to school but because there are lots of online things that you can be doing i mean there's so many online courses that you could take and as long as you can sort of develop a kind of connection with other people um, which is which is why I went to art school and also to learn. Um, I, you know, I hesitate to uh, to say don't go to school because I think it's really important sometimes. But it's it's just it's different than I went to when I went. Do you work? Denise asks, do you work alone? Do you work in solitude? And when you were a student um, or in your first jobs, you know, right after college, how did you find space to create? I've I've always worked out of my residence. Um, and you know what? What was really helpful to me was after after I left art school, I, I still kept in touch with all with the people I went to art school with. So we would, you know, like, and I always lived downtown. Like at that time, I was living downtown Toronto, and um, and we would work and work, and then we'd like, like we literally sometimes met at the Howard Johnsons at two a.m. for a coffee, and then went back to work. Like it, we we just had a little community. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I think that kind of thing is is really important, but. Um, I've always worked from my home um, just because I, you know, sometimes the hours are, are crazy and I, you know, and it's, and it's more comfortable. So, so this is my studio up here. I, I like working with lots of light. I've got my little cat fast asleep. Here. Frida. Frida. <laughs> um, Larry asks if you've ever rendered a portrait of yourself. And I think we. I did. Yeah. I have one in Alta. Larry, you must have Alta. I know Larry. Um, but was that, how did, was that different than doing a portrait of anyone else? You know, I can't remember why I did that. I did that quite a while ago. Um, uh, I think, I, I think I did that so I could do things with it. Like I remember taking that, um, and, and I, I had to give a talk in Texas and giving myself horns and, you know, so I would do that and then play with it. But, um, doing a, oh, it's, it's really hard to do self-portraits. I don't know. I think, I think. You see a lot of famous artists sort of doing self self portrait after self portrait after self portrait, like Frida Kahlo. Um, I don't know. It's it's hard to get it right. <laughs> I hate to ask, but so many people are asking: Do you have any of your larger scale works in your immediate presence that you can show us? I do not. They're all in storage because I because I I wouldn't be able to move around up here. <laughs> Is there a place where we can see them online? Can we, where? I know, okay, the, I did I did another book called Another History of Art. And if you look up Another History of Art and then Anita Kunz, you can, uh, that, that's Fantagraphics published that and a lot of those paintings are big. Like there's one, I did this kind of altar piece that's, it's gotta be 19 feet across. Like it's huge and it's, it's, it's made up of several parts. So, um, so those are in storage. I just can't. <laughs> we will find that book and a link to that book and send it to everyone along with the link to this video. Last question before we wrap it up, we've gone a little over. Thank you, Anita and everyone. Um, who are some other artists we should be checking out? Who is wonderful that we don't know about yet? 
You know what? You asked me this yesterday and I started a list and the list is too long. The list is too long. I mean, when I, when I was a young- Give me three. Elizabeth, give you three. Okay. When I was young, my biggest hero was Ralph Steadman. Ralph Steadman. So if you want to look up Ralph Steadman, he's still, he's still going strong. He's, I think he's 85. My, another big hero was Sue Ko, S-U-E-C-O-E. And she was an illustrator now. She's doing fine art. At that time, another hero was Barbara Nessam. Um, I, okay. So I think you asked me for women. So, uh, so I, I mean, okay. So I, so my fine art heroes at the, at this point are Jenny Figgis, Carol Wainio, Kara Walker, Michaelleen Thomas, Beth Kavner, and Nicola Hicks, who do incredible sculpture. So I'll give you these, I'll give you links if you want after this. So um, there are some incredible women, like Nora Krug is doing incredible graphic novels. Anna Juan is a, is a Madrid-based illustrator. Gizem Verrill, uh, Julia Breckenreed, Jillian Tamaki, Sandra Dionisi, who are friends of mine in Toronto, Ellen Weinstein, Yuko Shimizu, Victor Nagai, now I'm sure I said that wrong, Balbuso twins. And that's just, I didn't want to do this because there's so many more and I'm sure I've left <laughs> so many and that's not even the guys. And there are a lot of really, really amazing male illustrators. So anyway. <laughs> I'm sure there are. I'm not worried about men getting too much attention right now. Um, but that is, an, <laughs> that is an incredible list and we will do our best for Jessica, our wonderful, uh, my teammate, Jessica is, I'm sure, scribbling rapidly, but we will get this list and email it to everyone. Um, I think it's so, you know, I love that you've kind of created this book to celebrate women that we may or may not know about in, in these beautiful portraits. And so I love being able um, to, that you're so generous with your knowledge about other artists that we should check out as well. I, I, the community of artists is, is beautiful. So thank you, Anita. Thank you so much. Um, so for the, before you leave, wonderful audience, we're going to take a 180 next week. Please join us. We will be live from, from uh, San Juan Capistrano from the Heritage Barbecue Smoker with Chef Daniel Castillo in conversation with Alta Journal reporter Gustavo Ariana. We're going to try and do this live from a barbecue joint. Join us to see some amazing food and to see if we can pull it off logistically. Um, but I am so honored. What an absolute treat to have you join us today, Anita. It's um, It's been a real thrill getting to know you and to see so much of your beautiful work. Thank you. So much. I, I knew this would go by quickly. Thank you so much. It's a real honor. Thank you. It did. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.